So I was on a call with a new client the other day and he asked me, Stacy, I'd like to submit an SBIR application to the National Institute of Health. Should I go for a phase one, a phase two, a direct to phase two, or a fast track SBIR application? And it had occurred to me that this is a very common question I get all the time, especially from founders developing new biomedical or healthcare related technologies. So in this video, I'm gonna break down why you should go for the NIH SBIR program for your startup, how much funding you can secure, and everything you need to know about all these different funding opportunities so that you can pursue the best option for you. Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. I'm Stacey Chin from keepyourequity.co, and our mission is to help startup founders just like you secure non-dilutive funding so that you can bring your innovative ideas to the commercial market. If you're developing a technology or innovation in the medical or healthcare space, let's first jot down some really important background information before we jump into it. I'm sure this is no surprise to you, but developing any new technologies in medicine and healthcare is very difficult. And this is for all startups developing new medical device products, therapeutics, digital health platforms, software platforms, diagnostics, and many more. In fact, it is estimated that over 75% of US-based medical startups will fail. And there are several reasons for this. First, the US-based healthcare ecosystem is just so complex. There are so many rules and FDA regulations that startups must adhere to just to get these medical devices, therapeutics, or even any healthcare products through the pipeline. Second, the timeline from concept to commercialization is very long. For example, the Tufts Center for a Study of Drug Development reported it takes an average of 10 to 15 years for a new drug to make its way from discovery to the marketplace. And the third reason, it takes so much capital just to innovate in this space. Not only do you need a lot of money to test and develop these new innovations, even more capital is required for clinical testing, pursuing clinical trials, securing patents, obtaining FDA approval, and just to stay in compliance with all the different FDA regulations. Each of these steps can easily cost up to $100,000. And unfortunately, these expenses are just the beginning of your bill. Because innovating in medicine and healthcare is so risky and takes so much capital, it's nearly impossible to secure outside funding from angels or venture capitalists until you have validated a proof of concept, especially as a first time founder. And even if you can secure pre seed or seed funding in the early days of your startup journey, you usually have to give away a big chunk of your company's equity away to these investors to compensate for the risk they're taking on by investing in your startup and in you. So what are other funding opportunities for you? Well, there's always non-dilutive federal grant funding. So despite these hurdles, the US government wants founders to take these risks on and to innovate in healthcare and medicine by giving away free money to these startups through federal programs called the SBIR and the STTR. In fact, the US government budgets about $1.2 billion each year just for the National Institute of Health, or NIH, to support R&D efforts to bring new biomedical technologies towards commercialization. And because of that, the NIH SBIR and STTR programs are so critical to advance biomedical technologies in healthcare and medicine for four reasons. First, funding from these programs can allow startups to investigate whether their innovative ideas can actually solve a particular pain point in healthcare or medicine better than the current options in the market. Second, startups can pursue the necessary R&D efforts to overcome early stage technical hurdles to de-risk their innovation. And with less risk, companies are in a better position later to secure additional funding as needed. Third, startups can use this funding to validate the commercial potential of their innovation. Again, this is so important to increase the valuation of their company and to also attract outside investors to support their next stages of development. And fourth, these SBIR and STTR programs offer non-dilutive funding to startups, which means founders can keep all their equity in their startup, which is essential, especially in the very early days of development. So by now, hopefully you're super pumped to pursue an NIH SBIR or STTR application for your startup. But there's still a couple of things you need to know 
to understand which is the best opportunity to pursue for you and your startup. So the NIH sends out a funding opportunity announcement or FOA three times each year under the omnibus solicitation or parent announcements to encourage entrepreneurs and founders to secure non-dilutive funding from the NIH. The standard application deadlines are January 5th, April 5th, and September 5th. Due dates that fall either on a weekend or a federal holiday gets pushed to the next business day. You can find these FOAs for these funding opportunities under the title Omnibus Solicitation of the NIH and CDC for the Small Business Innovation Research Grant Application or Omnibus Solicitation of the NIH and CDC for Small Business Technology Transfer Grant Applications. Now, the notice or FOA number for each of these Omnibus Solicitations differ depending whether you're going for either an NIH SBI NIH STTR, or if you're proposing to conduct a clinical trial. I'll leave a link in the description where you can learn all of the updated FOA numbers for 2023. And I'll leave another link to a video where you can learn whether an SBIR or an STTR is the right fit for you and your startup. So once you figure out when you'll submit this grant application and whether you want to pursue an SBIR or an STTR, and if you're going to conduct a clinical trial, the next thing to figure out is whether you're going for a phase one, a phase two, a direct to phase two, or a fast track SBIR application. And the answer at its core just comes down to where you currently are in your developments, along with what are your short and long-term goals for your startup. Many times, founders have asked me, is there one that's less competitive than the other? And unfortunately, my response is no. Each NIH SBIR or STTR application is just as competitive as the other, each for their own unique reasons. However, it's important for you to pick the right opportunity so that you can prepare a really strong grant application to increase your chances of award. So in the next part of this video, I'm going and break down the differences between these different funding opportunities that you can pursue for the NIH program. But before I jump into it, please like and subscribe to this channel because 85% of you watching hasn't done so yet. And as a brand new channel, it really helps me out a lot. And importantly, if you haven't subscribed, then you'll be missing out on all the ways that you can secure non-dilutive funding for you and your startup without giving away any of your equity. And don't forget to check out our website at keepyourequity.co where you'll find more templates and resources to help you in your fundraising journey. Okay, let's jump into it. The first route to get NIH SBIR or STT funding is through the phase one application. So the purpose of these programs is to help startups establish the scientific merit, technical merit, feasibility of the proposed research. Here, your goal is to validate whether or not your innovation has potential for commercialization. So if you are a brand new startup with a groundbreaking idea, but you haven't done any research or development efforts to prove that your idea works, then a phase one application is a good fit for you. Phase one applications don't require you to include any preliminary data, although presenting some early findings would greatly strengthen your application, since this helps to justify the need for phase one funding support. At the end of phase one, your goal is to develop some sort of prototype or MVP or minimum viable product and to test it against a leading competitor so that you can demonstrate its value proposition and that your solution might have a leg up compared to other state-of-the-art offerings. And for that reason, a lot of thought has to go into your R&D strategy. And if you haven't seen my other videos, I would advise to spend at least three months to prepare your SBIR application especially if you're doing this for the very first time. In your phase one application, you'll want to inform the reviewers what experiments you plan to do, a justification as to why you're doing those experiments, how you plan to perform these studies, how are you collecting and then analyzing that data, what are the anticipated deliverables, and what problems may you encounter along the way and solutions to solve them. And all of your technical arguments and your hypothesis should be supported by existing peer review research to justify the need for your proposed research efforts. Your NIH phase one SBIR or STTR application will require you to prepare a six page research strategy. And this is the main technical document that will undergo the most scrutiny from the reviewers. In addition to the research strategy, there are lots of other supporting documents, such as the abstract, the project narrative, the budget, budget justification, bio sketches, facilities and resources, specific aims, reference lists, and letters of support. Now, if you go for a phase one application, you can request a proposed budget 
up to $295,000 of non-dilutive funding for a six to 12 month project period. I'll leave a link in the description if you wanna learn more about budgeting for your NIH, SBIR, and STTR application. There, I'll dive deeper into the three categories you have to consider when preparing your budget. So once you get your phase one awarded and you complete your phase one efforts, the startup can proceed and prepare a phase two application to the NIH. And the purpose of phase two SBIR or STTR funding is to allow the startup to continue their their phase one R&D efforts. But in phase two, now your goal is focused on transforming the proposed innovation into a product or service that can be commercialized and eventually generate lots and lots of revenue for your company. Now to pursue a phase two application, your startup must have been awarded a phase one application. And because of that, the chances of securing a phase two application is actually much higher compared to the other opportunities. Although they're still very competitive. In phase two, startups should still propose a rigorous R&D strategy. However, unlike phase one, the experiments proposed should be more aligned to overcome the technical hurdles required for commercialization. Some of these examples can be optimizing the product or the device towards a commercial product, overcoming scalability or manufacturing hurdles, pursuing animal studies, conducting clinical trials, or pursuing other studies required for regulatory approval. And for these reasons, it's very important that you and your team are well suited to pursue these commercialization efforts. That means not only do you and your team have to be experts in the scientific, the clinical, and the technical side of the innovation and strategy, but you also need other consultants and expertise in business, finance, legal, and regulatory as well. I'll leave another link in the description below that goes over how you can structure your phase one versus your phase two team for your SBIR or STTR application. Now for a phase two application, you're required to prepare a 12 page research strategy and a 12 page commercialization plan. You can think of these applications as phase one applications on steroids. In addition to these documents, you must include all the other supporting documents as well. So startups pursuing a phase two application can request up to $1.9 million of non-dilutive funding for a project period of 24 months. And because you have a good chance of getting phase two funding and that this is non-dilutive funding that can really make or break your startup, you wanna make sure you give yourself enough time to prepare this application. Now, the third funding route that you can consider is the direct to phase two application. A direct to phase two NIH SBIR or STTR application is pretty much the exact same thing as a phase two application, except for one distinct difference. With a direct to phase two application, startups are not required to have completed an SBIR phase one award. Despite this, your startup must have very strong preliminary data from previous research efforts. And these results should demonstrate proof that your innovation already has commercial potential and thus it's ready to begin your phase two efforts. Typically, these startups that are ready to pursue a direct to phase two application has already secured other funding opportunities or have outside funding support to pursue these very early R&D investigations. So if you don't have strong preliminary data that can back up the commercial potential of your innovation, then unfortunately a direct to phase two application is may not be the right fit for you. Finally, the fourth option that you can consider is a fast track application. The purpose of a fast track application is to allow startups to submit both phase one and phase two applications together. And this opportunity can be a great way to expedite the award decision. However, the NIH would only award startups a fast track application with scientifically meritorious projects that has a very high potential for commercialization. So these grants are very, very competitive. Since you have to thoroughly think through your R&D efforts, both for phase one and then for phase two, there is a mountain of effort that has to go into a fast track application. Just to give you an idea, the last fast track application I've worked on with a client took at least six months to complete. So if you decide to go for a fast track application, make sure you include a statement that explicitly informs the reviewers about what key quantitative metrics that would help you demonstrate phase one success, and that are the check marks to proceed to phase two. We call these the go, no-go metrics. And if you don't clearly articulate what these go or no-go metrics are in your fast track application, reviewers are gonna call you out on that, and unfortunately, it will ding your score. Fast track applications will also require you to prepare a 12-page research strategy and a 12-page commercialization plan, along with all the supporting documents that I've mentioned before. Because it combines phase one plus phase two, you can ask for the same amount of $295,000 of funding 
for your phase one application and then up to $1.9 million for a 24 month period within your phase two application. So that means with a fast track application, you have the opportunity to secure over $3 million of non-diluted funding for a total project period of over three years. Even though the potential of securing a big chunk of money for your startup seems super enticing through this fast track opportunity. If you decide to go for it, make sure you're ready to roll up your sleeves and get to work. And with that, thank you so much for watching this video. If you found these tips helpful, please like and subscribe and comment below. Tell me how you guys navigate these different SBIR opportunities and which is the best fit for you. And as always, don't forget to check out our website at keepyourequity.co for more resources, templates, and advice of how you can secure non-dilutive funding throughout your fundraising journey. Thank you for joining me today and I'll see you very soon.